As Microsoft's president, Brad Smith leads a team of more than 1,500 business, legal, and corporate affairs professionals located in 54 countries and operating in more than 120 nations. He plays a key role in spearheading the company's work on critical issues involving the intersection of technology and society, including cybersecurity, privacy, artificial intelligence, environmental sustainability, human rights, immigration, and philanthropy. In his recent best-selling book, co-authored with Microsoft's Caroline Brown, Tools and Weapons, The Promise and Peril of the Digital Age, Smith urges the tech sector to assume more responsibility and calls for government to move faster to address the challenges that new technologies are creating. Prior to joining Microsoft, Smith was an associate and then partner at the law firm of Covington and Burling, where he is still remembered as the first attorney in the long history of the firm to insist in 1986 on having a personal computer on his desk as a condition for accepting a job offer. The New York Times has called Smith the de facto ambassador for the technology industry at large. And the Australian Financial Review is described him as one of the technology industry's most respected figures. He has testified numerous times before the U.S. Congress and other governments on these key policy issues. In this conversation with Great Communicators series, Mr. Smith is interviewed by Reagan Institute Director Roger Zakon. Thanks for listening. We hope you enjoy the conversation. Brad Smith, welcome to the show. Thank you for being here. Well, thank you. It's a real pleasure to be here. Thanks so much. Well, I am envious. You're out in Washington in the sunny skies. It's cold and windy here in D.C. Uh, what are you doing right over there in Washington? Well, you know, wait a day, and I'm sure we'll have role reversal when it comes to weather. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's uh, we're in the middle of COVID-19 here as everywhere. But, um, you know, life goes on. Work needs to progress. And, uh, you know, at a company like Microsoft in the tech sector, um, we better do our job or a lot of other people are not going to be able to do ours, given their reliance on our technology. Yeah, even more more important now than ever, uh, given everybody's or most people are working from home. Um, you know, before we jump in and I want to talk about Microsoft and the pandemic, but uh, most know you now as the, the president of, of Microsoft, but you start off as a lawyer, something we have in, in common. Um, you have always had an interest in technology. Uh, and when you started out in private practice back in the, during the Reagan presidency, I'm like, yes. um, you were one of those people who demanded a desktop computer at one of these law firms that uh, associates at that time could not make demands. Tell us about that particular story, which I love, but more broadly about this intersection for you between interest in law and technology. Well, I was interested at the time, this obviously was the 1980s, as you mentioned, in the intersection between, say, public policy and, and, and technology. Uh, I had been a graduate student with my wife in Geneva, Switzerland, at the height of the negotiations around the uh, European Intermediate Nuclear Forces, you know, something that President Reagan uh, was obviously very focused on. Uh, and uh, I, I had bought a personal computer my last year of law school. I was just amazed at how I was a not just faster but better writer. I bought a new one and took it with me into the uh, federal courthouse in lower Manhattan for a year. And then when I uh, got a job offer from Covington and Burling in Washington, D.C., the law firm I really wanted to work at, I did something that in some ways, when I look back, surprises me. I said I would only accept the offer if they would give me a personal computer. It was <laughs> such an unusual request that it required the approval of the management committee of the firm. There were people who wondered why I thought I needed one. After all, they had a lot of legal secretaries. And I just made the case that I would be a better lawyer if I could use a computer. And thankfully, they agreed to give me one. Yeah, to Covington and Burling's credit, they they saw, kind of looked past their tradition and accommodated you. And clearly, you were ahead of the curve. Uh, you know, you've been at, at Microsoft for some time, an amazing company founded in 1975. Uh, you know, uh, now it has well, about 144,000 employees. Market cap were, you know, $1.5 trillion, just huge. Um, what's remarkable about it is, is that it's reinvented itself. Well, many things are remarkable, but, it, but really in, in, in terms of as a technology company to continue to keep pace and to lead. What's your kind of, what's the secret sauce? You've been with the company so long, obviously president leading it. Uh, tell us about how the company continues to lead. 
Well, first of all, I think you put the, your finger on one part that is so critical. You cannot be a technology leader on a sustained basis unless you continually reinvent yourself. And one of the more interesting facts about Microsoft is if you look at the, uh, the 10 most valuable companies in the world, uh, in, in, say, uh, you know, uh, 1999, 2009, 2019, and indeed 2020, there's only one company that is on that list throughout, and it's Microsoft. And I think it's two things. One is this relentless willingness to challenge conventional assumptions about how people want to use technology. So constant change. Um, that challenges tradition almost. But at the same time, what really matters, I think, is an abiding devotion to certain values that we consider to be timeless, um, that are not just you know, values of a particular decade, but you know, protecting people's privacy, we talk about, you know, protecting their security. I think fundamentally it is a commitment to honesty, to transparency, directness. Um, I think those values are timeless. And it is the ability to keep both of these things, constant change and constant commitment to timeless values, as two sides of the same coin uh, that explain at least part of our success. Well, well uh, really, really like that. that. And, and here yeah, at the uh, uh, Reagan Institute, you know, timeless values is something that uh, we spend a lot of time thinking about. about certain value and, and, and want to advance. Um, and we're going to get into privacy and security and, 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 and the honesty, um, the transparency, which I think you know, I've heard you speak about in the past and, and really are critical, particularly this moment in time. Uh, but at the outset, we we're talking about the pandemic um, and technology in particular has been really a, kind of a centerpiece of the conversation. Uh, Americans who lack the technology that's needed, you know, when we think about education, uh, technology has been able to surmount the changes, the challenges of the pandemic. Uh, so here are both sides of it. Just has anything surprised you uh, over the course of this pandemic in terms of what top technology has been able to do and what has it fallen short of, of, of doing? I would offer three quick observations. First, I think technology has done a pretty remarkable job of enabling more people to work from home or remotely than we might have imagined when the year began, and just beyond what could have been imagined a decade ago. Uh, just think about what it would have been like if it were 2010 or 2005 and we had been staring at speaker phones all day. Uh, I just don't think we could have sustained productivity or remote economic activity more broadly to the extent we have. Second, I do think that technology has played a profoundly important role in trying to address some of the public health challenges we're confronting. Uh, I think data uh, has been an indispensable tool in helping us monitor and manage public health. Uh, you listen to the radio on a day like today, and you hear the sports report, the weather report, and the COVID-19 cases from your state yesterday. And you know, but, but it's a crash course in how data is being put to work. And it's not just for the public health authorities. It, it's really for all of the work around vaccination trials and therapeutic advances. But then there's a third lesson that I think is also really interesting, and it's an important one for everybody like me who works in tech to remember. Simpler and trustworthy will likely succeed in a way that complicated or less trustworthy technology will not. Uh, in the United States in particular, in March, and April, there was a huge uh, level of often academic enthusiasm around you know, pretty complicated Bluetooth tracing apps that had a mm -hmm. wonderful theoretical underpinning but you know, here it is November, and you don't really see those being adopted very substantially anywhere in the world. At the same time, I was uh, in Athens uh, five weeks ago for the, their uh, annual uh, democracy forum. And I found it so interesting. They've been much more successful than most countries in managing COVID-19. And they created a very simple SMS-based app that people had to use on their phone before they left the house in the height of lockdown, they had to send a message and use one of six numbers that corresponded with the uh, ability to leave the house. 
If you were going to the grocery store, you press two. If you were going to walk mm. your dog, you press six. And everybody started to use it. They changed what they did, but how they talked. People were sharing stories. If they were going to the grocery store, they would text their neighbor, I'm going out for a number two. Uh, <laughs> I thought it was fascinating. Dog adoptions in Greece increased 60% year over year because that was a number six and you could leave the house. Um, and I just think that's a good reminder about the role of technology uh, and what you have to do in order to really do something well. You know, you have kind of talked about the digitalization of the manufacturing floor and this idea that, you know, the advent of new technologies, you know, right, it could be COVID that accelerated this, will ultimately uh, kind of replace jobs uh, that uh, beforehand, uh, you know, were done uh, manually. How much has COVID uh, kind of reinforced uh, that view, or to what extent has COVID uh, revealed that of, of the digitization of the manufacturing floor? Well, fundamentally, what COVID has done is accelerate digitalization virtually across the economy. So we've seen this everywhere in the world and in every sector of the economy. Um, I think it was genuinely the case that in uh, March and April, we saw probably two years of digitalization take place in two months. When it comes to manufacturing, I think it is doing two things that are very similar to what we've seen throughout the economy for probably 150 years. First, some jobs are being automated. Uh, you know, it's bringing new efficiency. It's actually, uh, you know, something that offers, I think, real, uh, real prospect for a resurgence in the competitiveness of American manufacturing, as it does make manufacturing in the United States uh, more competitive and more efficient. But the other thing it's doing, and we shouldn't lose sight of this, is at the same time that it may eliminate certain jobs on a manufacturing floor, it is, in, it is creating entirely new lines of business. And that in turn creates entirely new jobs for people. Um, a great example, one of my favorites having grown up in, in Wisconsin, is some of the work by Johnson Controls, JCI. They build huge HVAC systems, for example. Uh, and you know, today they come with sensors and those sensors report data back and JCI can monitor your building for you and they can do predictive maintenance and tell you when you are going to need to send somebody uh, to go uh, repair an HVAC system before it breaks down. And that kind of business is springing up all around the manufacturing of all kinds of goods. We see it with Rolls-Royce and General Electric and, and aircraft engines, for example. So it means old jobs are being challenged, new jobs are being created, and of course it means new skilling opportunities and challenges for these jobs too. I, I want, want to go, go in a moment to uh, your status as, as a cyber diplomat or tech, technoplat. Uh, but before I, before we go there, one more in the manufacturing because you know so much of what's happened in the country uh, with President Trump's election in 2016 and over the past four years has been the skepticism about the, the theory that you know new jobs, new sectors will emerge that will provide better opportunities for those who are on the manufacturing floor. Um, from a policy standpoint. Um, you know, are we, are, we, are we addressing those needs now in a smarter, better way in 2020 than we were, let's say, uh, from 2012 to 2016? Um, where, where do you think we are in terms of uh, truly uh, uh, filling those gaps? I mean, you're sitting out uh, in, in Washington uh, with uh, Washington State uh, leading a, a huge tech company. Much, much of this is about, you know, kind of middle America and, and jobs that, that were lost and, and found their way overseas. Well, I think that we probably shouldn't give ourselves too high a grade uh, as a nation for, say, the last decade. And I'd say that regardless of whether one is thinking about 2010 to 2016 or 2017 to 2020. Uh, yeah, to me, um, we need to do two things and we need to do them together. Um, one is to continue to have an immigration policy that enables people of great talent to come to the United States, get their education and stay here and create jobs and build companies, but do it in a way that is equally balanced with an even 
greater investment in the skilling of Americans. Uh, you know, we reached a point where by 2015, I think it was fair to say it had become apparent that, you know, computer science really is the, the, the most important scientific field of the next uh, decade or so. And we're not yet doing enough uh, at any level of government, I think, uh, to make sure that we're enabling more American students in K-12 and especially high school, uh, you know, to take uh, computer science classes. Uh, I think that, you know, we have more to do to help this generation of college students, especially in community colleges, get the skills they need uh, and, and find the jobs that they want. And then I think to me, what is perhaps most significant is uh, to think about the role of employers in skilling employees. Um, when we have really, what we saw is in the 1980s and 90s, American employers increased their per capita investments in the training of their employees. And it makes sense. You know, people had to be trained in how to use a personal computer and how to use a, a, a product like Microsoft Word. And then we reached this point where we just assumed that people either knew or could figure it out. Mm -hmm. And what we saw was between 2000 and 2010, a decline in employer-sponsored training. And then we have just completed a decade of stagnation. And as we look to skills on the manufacturing floor or skills for almost everyone in every job, uh, I think we uh, need employers to step up and do more. And I think we should be looking to, among other things, federal tax policy that might, for example, provide tax credits, especially for smaller businesses to invest in training of employees and say training and onboarding of new employees. This is the kind of thing in my view that not only would help encourage employment, but the investment in lifelong skills that people could use. And, and, and that in turn, I think would make manufacturing in every sector more competitive. So, so you just hit on uh, policy, and, and one of the things that um, I thought was so remarkable about the book, Tools and Weapons, The Promise and the Peril of the Digital Age, which you wrote along with your colleague, Carolyn Brown, uh, was how much you, know, you hit on a variety of policy areas, everything from what you talked about uh, earlier on privacy law to now you're talking about uh, tax policy. Um, it just reveals your, your Covington and Burling or Geneva roots, which is this interest in, in public public policy and, and, and more broadly this public diplomacy, which we'll talk about too. Um, you know, you have this uh, great little anecdote in that book, uh, of course, one that would catch the eye of, of, of this podcast, that is Reaganism, where you, you kind of introduce this notion of how government uh, and tech interact. And, and, and my sense is that uh, government oftentimes is behind the curve in terms of where technology is going. And, and you know that in 1983, a President Reagan, along with the First Lady, uh, had a, uh, a, a viewing of the film War Games, um, which had only you know, premiered, I think, the day before they watched it, which uh, for those watchers and listeners who don't know, is, is uh, basically a case where uh, our uh, North American Aerospace Defense Command, or NORAD, is, is hacked. And it's the first time Americans see how technology can disrupt and perhaps threaten our lives by uh, uh, you know, creating kind of nuclear war. Uh, tell me about why that figured into your book and, and kind of almost as a metaphor for the challenges of, of kind of government and technology uh, companies that interact and understand each other. Sure. I, I, well, you know, interestingly, the roots of American cybersecurity policy come out of a a weekend evening at Camp David when President and Nancy Reagan saw that film. And it is a, a reflection of, to me, one of the really interesting coincidences in American history. Uh, one of the two writers uh, of the script for that movie uh, grew up in Hollywood. Uh, when he was a kid, his parents were active. His mother was a famous actress. Uh, they would have friends over to watch a screening in their house. And invariably, the first people to arrive were Ronald and Nancy Reagan. And so this little boy would open the door and show them in, and he grew up knowing the Reagans. And so then by another coincidence, just as he was uh, finishing the, the, the movie, 
Uh, Nancy Reagan was back in Los Angeles. They, they saw each other literally passing each other on the freeway as her motorcade wow. went by. And uh, she gestured, give me a call. And he arranged for them to be able to watch that movie. The movie, for anybody who remembers it, is basically about uh, you know, NORAD turning over uh, the decision making about launching intercontinental ballistic missiles to a mainframe computer. And the mainframe computer didn't exactly get things right. And humanity was at the brink uh, before a teenager managed to intervene and persuade the powers that be to stop the process. The fascinating thing was the following week, President Reagan went back. He was in the Oval Office. He had the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and cabinet secretaries, and he told them about the movie. No one had seen it. He recounted it, and then he asked the chair of the Joint Chiefs, could this happen? And he said, I don't know. I'll go find out. And he came back and said, it's actually worse than the movie depicted, meaning you could hack your way right. uh, in, into uh, you know, a, a government computer in this way. Uh, and so that led to the first uh, you know, national security agency directive to harden the defenses of the government's computers. And it led to the enactment in 1986 of the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, basically to make it a criminal act to hack into a computer. That is where cybersecurity policy in the United States started. And I, all, I just love the fact that it also just speaks to President Reagan's curiosity, mm -hmm. his willingness to uh, look around uh, and ask the people who work for him. And I have to say, and I'm forgetting the name, but whoever the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff was, give that person enormous credit for saying, I don't know, but I'll go find out. Right. <laughs> and, then, and then come back and say, uh, actually, Mr. President, you were on to something that we had missed, uh, and we should go work on this. So I, I actually, that's a great story. <laughs> but but to, to, let's, let's, let's go, let's fast forward from, you know, that 1983 screening to your experience today. I mean, so much of, of what you do, uh, certainly if you read the book, you're, you're interfacing with governments all the time in the United States and around the world. You referenced trip before to, to Greece. Um, give me your sense of, of, of how sophisticated our policymakers and elected officials are with technology. How much are we speaking past each other, uh, whether it be on privacy or immigration uh, or a myriad of other issues, uh, because they simply don't really have the facility uh, and, and to understand what the technology is and what and how it's used? I would say two things, um, because I think your question is such an important one. The first is one should not for a moment underestimate the level of sophistication, especially in parts of the United States government. You know, when I interact with people in the Department of Defense or at the NSA, they have a deep and very uh, sophisticated understanding of both the nature of, say, the cybersecurity threats in the world today and what we need to do to respond. Increasingly, I have to say, when I talk to members of the Senate or House Intelligence or Armed Services Committees, I find a similar level of sophistication. What we're not doing enough of yet, in my view, is having a more public conversation. Uh, about this. Uh, and I think that's what we need. Uh, to me, that's one of the real contributions of, say, the, the, the Reagan uh, National Defense Forum and, and the meetings that take place, because we need to broaden the public conversation about this. Uh, at Microsoft just a few weeks ago, um, we published uh, the most thorough report that I actually think any company and maybe most governments have ever, ever published, uh, you know, a digital defense report. And you know, we've had to develop, I'll just say, among other things, a level of political courage that we did not have five years ago. You know, we go in this report and, and we name names. Um, you know, we point to the groups in Russia, China, North Korea, and Iran that are uh, launching attacks. Uh, and we describe those groups, the kinds of attacks that are taking place. Um, and. Uh, I, I do believe that we need to bring people together, 
in other parts of the Congress, other parts of the government, the public at large, and then ultimately what we really need to do is unite the world's democracies. There are 76 democratic nations in the world. 3.7 billion people live in them. I don't believe we're doing enough to work together to fight these cyber threats. So, so I, 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 I want to go, go to this you know, digital diplomacy, the tech diplomacy, because that is a huge undertaking in which you spent a lot of time and actually made some progress again. So I want to talk about it. But, you know, I, I don't want to look over what you just said, which is here you are, president of the leading, a leading tech company. And without hesitation, reference your discussions with the National Security Agency and the Department of Defense. And you've been a great contributor for, for years now at the Reagan National Defense Forum. You can't do that unless that's one of those values, right? You're just saying, let the default, chips fall where they fall. We're going to work with government, you know, flawed, but they, as, wherever they may be, we're going to work them to a, a more perfect union. union. Um, how hard is that? How much resistance do you face, or is the is the rap on tech companies not really being able to be a partner of the government, um, perhaps not 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 accurate, or certainly not what the what the headlines make you make suggest it is. Well, I just think there's room for improvement all around. I think we in the tech sector can and need to do better, and I think in every government, every democratic government in the world, we can and need to do better as well. I think we need to share more information with each other. We need to be able to acknowledge that we won't always see eye to eye. Uh, and one of the other uh, obvious uh, you know, episodes we share in our book is when we've gone to court to protect the privacy of our customers when we have felt that the Justice Department, say, was overreaching. Uh, by seeking customer uh, data in a way that we did not feel was lawful or appropriate. But at the end of the day, look, we're an American company that needs to focus on America and the interests of our country and then find a way to prosper within those interests. And I've always felt that this is sort of the exact opposite of you know, the old slogan about what's uh, good for General Motors is good for America. I always have you, let's identify what's good for America, and we at Microsoft will find plenty of room uh, under that umbrella to succeed. And I like to remind people um, that we are a global company, uh, but 95% of our revenue comes from the 76 nations that are classified as democratic countries in the world today. So I think of a big part of our role uh, as to be the technology provider and protector of the world's democracies. And if you can get up in the morning and think of that as your mission, you can go find the courage to go what needs to be done. So, so, so much, much emphasis on, you know, I mean, that's, that's a remarkable number. 95% of your revenue comes from uh, the world's democracies. We're going to get to China in a little bit, but there has to be a story about China uh, to get there. But, but, but before we do that, um, you reference not only places where you cooperate with government, where you challenge government. And, and it's a remarkable story at the outset of, of your book in terms of the, um, the Electronic Communication Privacy Act and, and how, which is also a Reagan era, era law, actually, which, which you know, uh, where you challenge government. And while litigation wasn't the best tool, it was the, the, the tool available to you at the time, and then ultimately legislation uh, came around. But, but, you know, this balancing of privacy and national security, my impression from reading the book and, and from talking to you and listening to you over the years, really had a profound impact on, on your outlook, um, where really you had to move to policy because you felt you know, litigation wasn't going to get you there in the way you wanted to get there. But, did I get that right? And can I speak more about that, that tension point between privacy and security? You did get it right, and I would say two things. First, I do believe that fundamentally um, it's like so many things. It, it, you, you can't be 100 percent security and zero percent privacy or the alternative either. And the more one gets both issues out on the table, has a direct and candid conversation with other people who are addressing them, uh, the more likely one is to find a solution that strikes the right balance. And in, in, frankly, in the wake of the Snowden disclosures, we and many tech companies were thrown on the defense 
are days when we still are on the defensive in Western Europe because of the concerns that those disclosures created. Um, so we have to protect people's privacy or we won't actually have the opportunity to even participate in, say, the European cloud services economy. And we have to uh, protect cybersecurity at the same time. It is an and, it is not an or. And then the second point I'll make is one that I think just underscores the profound importance of balance and discussion and sometimes unlikely allies. Hmm. To me, one of the most interesting political years of the last five decades is the year 1986. The immigration law that we have today is still largely the result of what was passed that year. The tax law that we have today has been amended, but not hugely. The basic structure came from the legislation in 1986. The privacy law of the United States today is still the Electronic Communications Privacy Act passed in 1986. And security, that Computer Fraud and Abuse Act I mentioned was passed in 1986. 1986 was a model year. It was a model year in substantial part because Ronald Reagan as president was able to push these things forward. And it was a model year because he and Tip O'Neill as the Democratic Speaker of the House of Representatives found a way to sit down and get things done together. And I think that bipartisan spirit is fundamental to our country. It requires balance, discussion, and some compromise. And thank goodness we had leaders then. Let's hope we can find leaders again who can bridge these kinds of divides. Yeah, yeah well, you'll, you'll never, never find someone, someone here at, at, at the Reagan Institute arguing that 1986 was not a model year. You, you've entered, entered friendly ter territory with that observation, as I think you know you would. Um, you make a really good set of points in terms of how uh, the technology uh, sector and community should interact with government at times of the challenges of seeking cooperation, seeking the right balance and policy. But you're not limited, and Microsoft's not limited uh, to the borders of the United States. Proud U.S. company, but as you outlined, it's global. Um, Talk to me about the digital Geneva Convention and the cyber attack accord. I mean, really, this tech diplomacy is not only uh, you know kind of interesting uh, kind of twenty first century uh, version of diplomacy, but one that you really spend a lot of time. What are you trying to create by leading this on behalf of, of, of ten companies, not just U.S. companies, tech companies, but global tech companies? We're trying to, in effect, strengthen both the rules of the road and the ability to protect against abuses. Uh, when it comes to cyber attacks, perhaps most especially by nation state sponsored cyber attacks. Uh, so one of the things we did was uh, organize what is called the Cybersecurity Tech Accord that has now been signed by more than 120 companies from 24 nations. And we work together uh, to promote a set of standards around the protection of cybersecurity. And we won't help any government attack innocent civilians in another country. And then the second concept that you mentioned, the Digital Geneva Convention, is, in my view, a very simple concept. In 1949, in the wake of World War II, the world came together and said that the governments of the, of the planet had not only a moral but legal responsibility, even in times of war, to protect civilians. And our basic point is we are currently living in what is supposed to mostly be a time of peace and yet we see some governments every day attacking civilians and attacking civilian infrastructure, including now our democratic and electoral infrastructure. Uh, and we need a set of, of binding rules and we need a commitment by the democracies of the world to hold authoritarian regimes accountable so that they keep their hands off of civilians in this time of peace when it comes to cyberspace. So this, this digital community, community event, I'm going to kind of drill down this just, just for a minute, because you referenced uh, a couple of minutes ago about this report that Microsoft released, which is comprehensive, and, and, and naming these countries, all of them are on the sanctions list, right? These are non-democratic states. If we were to have this digital Geneva Convention, would that report say something different? In your mind, right? What, what, what would we have today that we currently lack if, if, that's, if that uh, framework was in place? 
Well, to me, the number one thing we would have, and we, we've advocated for this and actually built up through what's called the Paris Call for Trust and Security in Cyberspace, um, you know, more than a thousand signatures, including uh, more than 70 governments, um, you know, espousing what I would call the rules of the road. Many of these rules of the road exist under international law today. Some of it fills in gaps, especially around, say, you know, threats on electoral processes and the like. But what we would have, in my view, is uh, what we've started to see, including over the last, uh, we would say we would see the principal NATO allies, as well as you know countries like Australia and New Zealand, among the the so-called Five Eyes. Um, yeah, you know, we would see these governments standing up together. They would be uh, you know putting an even stronger stake in the ground that says that we're not going to accept these kinds of attacks. Uh, we would see even more frequent and assertive action to name names when these attacks take place. And, and we would see that kind of public accountability backed uh, by what I think is increasingly needed and what we're starting to see. It's either deterrent doctrine in a place like the United States, where there have been real advances in DOD and the NSA over the last few years, um, or other multilateral steps um, that would make clear uh, that people cannot, these kind of authoritarian countries cannot these kinds of attacks with impunity. Um, I think that is just something we sh we can't afford to accept or tolerate. So, so calling them out, out, naming names, and I agree. I mean, I, I worked on Capitol Hill when uh, we used to require something we call the China Military Power Report, and, and they, the Department of Defense, wanted to classify the name because they didn't want to say uh, China. China's name in public, right? I mean, it was there was so much reticence. Obviously, that's changed a lot. But it's one thing to name names when it comes to North Korea and Iran. There's appetite for that. It's kind of acceptable. Russia, maybe maybe more so, or the same. But China, there's there's, there's real reticence, and and it's only in the past few years where there's been a willingness to do so. Um, certainly, with China's conduct with respect to Hong Kong uh, or or Uyghurs in Xinjiang province. I mean, these are all things that. Uh, has, have resulted in people speaking up. Um, you spent a, a good chapter in your book talking about China, if not more. Uh, quite interesting, really, like we said earlier, that 95% of your business is with the democracies of the world, not China. That's not true for companies. Uh, you know, and, and uh, you know, certainly Apple, uh, uh, a peer uh, tech company, you write about, they're, they're very much invested in, in, in China. Um, what's the right balance there? How do you, your, your chapter kind of says that we need to advance these timeless values, but at the same time, um, you're not advocating a full-on decoupling or separation either. No, I think, I actually think there's a lot to be learned uh, from the 1980s, uh, as well as prior decades, uh, uh, you know, in, in terms of other experience in dealing with other challenges or even threats around the world. Um, I don't believe we can completely decouple, but we should be hard-headed and realistic and have our eyes open. Um, yeah, there is not an open door to American technology in China today. I mean, with the exception of smartphones and some chips, you don't really see the, uh, the Chinese economy open uh, to uh, American technology. Uh, and I think that there are a lot of issues where, in areas where, from a U.S. government perspective, we don't necessarily want American technology uh, to be headed towards China. Uh, in some cases, it's because of the human rights ramifications of, say, something like uh, facial recognition, uh, even something like, uh, you know, email. Uh, you know, we, 15 years ago, said we wouldn't host our consumer email in China uh, because we felt it would put the human rights of, uh, of our consumers in China at risk. Um, so there's a whole host of limitations that I think need to be applied. Um, yeah, at the same time, um, uh, I think that there are certain areas where uh, you know, technology you know, can move from one part of the world to another, even without um, the level of trust you might otherwise see if you put appropriate safeguards in place. Um, it's something that we at Microsoft really had to think long and hard and roll up our sleeves about this summer because, you know, as was well publicized, uh, there were a couple of months where it looked like Microsoft might well end up buying the U.S., uh, Canadian, Australian, and New Zealand uh, versions of TikTok. 
Um, and we really had to think about how to put in place security controls, privacy controls, controls against dis disinformation, and to protect digital safety. So uh, I think at, at one level, um, we could, would benefit from having what I'll just call a more sophisticated conversation about what kinds of technology controls are, are needed. Uh, and again, to bring this out of, say, the corners where there are people who understand the issues well, whether they be in think tanks, academia, or government, um, because this is a democracy after all. Uh, we do need a level of public understanding. Well, I mean, you mentioned TikTok, which I'm pleased you did now. I could potentially interest my children in this conversation. Um, but yes, it was in headlines that Microsoft uh, was in the, you know, was, was involved in a potentially uh, a buyer. Um, and you write about this in the book, uh, again, Tools and Weapons. To what extent do you think there is a legitimate national security concern with uh, China having access to all of that data that TikTok generates uh, within the United States, all those young people doing the, the latest dance move? I mean, I, I did an interview where uh, a very intelligent person ex expressed deep skepticism that there was anything there that could uh, present a threat to U.S. national security. Um, you just kind of gave a, a glimpse into it. No, there, there are real concerns there. Unpack that for a minute, uh, because there is a lot of skepticism, particularly in the tech world, around, around those concerns. Well, I think there's um, three thoughts worth bearing in mind on this kind of consumer service. First, it's a mistake, uh, I think, always to minimize something as just sort of, you know, a bunch of teenagers doing dance videos or whatever. You know, consumer services always start out narrow and then they explode over time. Um, already, this one has 100 million Americans using it every month, 50 million Americans using it every day for an average of one hour per day. Uh, and, you know, what it really is a testament to is how engaging a 60-second video can and it be and is. And you can cover every or any issue under the sun. It's the, anything you can talk about in 60 seconds and link to another 60 seconds, uh, you, you can do through a consumer-oriented video service. Uh, the second is I do think that the protection of data is a real issue. Um, you can learn an awful lot uh, about people uh, based on what they choose to share, what they choose to like, what they choose to watch again, who they choose to follow. Uh, and uh, I, that doesn't mean that this can't be run in a way that is protected. And I, I know that ByteDance is committed with Oracle and uh, Walmart to doing that, but it's a real issue. Um, third, the most important issue in my view is not actually the privacy issue as important as it is. It's the potential uh, uh, abuse for disinformation. Uh, imagine that you got cable TV, but you got no remote control. Uh, instead, the provider decided what you would see next. That is what this kind of consumer service is. <laughs> and so imagine what you can do when you're basically changing the channel at least once every 60 seconds when you swipe up and go to the next video. Imagine what that means to slide into your, your video stream something that is going to send you in a different direction or, or take you away from a particular direction. Um, yeah, that is a tool when you add data and, I, uh, and AI that is, you know, frankly, potentially the most powerful disinformation tool that ha humanity has yet encountered. So again, I'm not trying to make a statement about yeah, whether something should be approved with these other companies, I, they're they're all I think doing important and and no doubt good work, but the biggest mistake I think we could make is to look away and refrain from thinking hard about how to manage this as one example of the next generation of technology challenges. I, I thought, thought that, that was a fantastic outline of the concern, and, and what's great about it, uh, you didn't even hit on the back door, you know, concern, which, you know, is, is almost like uh, the, the least sophisticated way of talking about uh, these concerns. 
perhaps even a legitimate concern, but there's so many other things which you just outlined. Uh, we only have a couple minutes left before we get to the lightning round, the all-important lightning round. But, you know, I do want to hit on um, the end of your book, Democratizing the Future. You talk about this open data revolution. What I like about that so much is we, we – are kind of moving, you, you, it's an optimistic view in terms of advancing our strengths, which is an open society, and you're trying to apply that to the world of, of, of data. Um, and um, you have to the point in part in a kind of not particularly intuitive story, which is the Trump campaign versus the Clinton campaign in terms of how they uh, uh, used data in 2016. Um, just give, give me the headline on, on what Trump did and, and Clinton did. It's a, it's a, it's a nice... Nice vignette in, in your book, but it ultimately tells the story of um, you go with the kind of what's out there and and and, and, and drive by necessity. But can you give us the headline on that on that piece of the book and that, that yeah. story. Yeah, no, the brief version, which we recount in our book, is understood by some, but not told broadly enough in, in our view. And as the company, we had the opportunity to interact with both campaigns and then do sort of postmortems after the 26 election, 2016 election. And the, the Trump campaign and the Republican National Committee, and it was really, you know, Reince Priebus and the people who worked for him, did an extraordinary job of building a federation of data sets uh, that then uh, was taken as the uh, fundamental infrastructure uh, by the Trump campaign because they didn't expect to get the nomination. They didn't have, uh, you know, that infrastructure themselves. So they used the data sets and then they worked uh, on how to get the most effective use out of that data uh, by going back repeatedly to people who they felt were not necessarily uh, sympathetic at that point to Donald Trump, but could be persuaded uh, and then could be moved to vote. And, uh, and they did that with enormous intensity in Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania, among a few other states. In 2016, you know, Hillary Clinton was the sort of pretty much undisputed front runner, with the exception of Bernie Sanders from the outset. She built up a huge data set herself, but she they didn't really bring in data from others. They didn't federate or you know combine their data sets. Um, they didn't continue to tweak their algorithms in the way that we thought was necessary, and they overestimated how they were going to do. And in effect, they were so confident, their data team was so confident that, uh, you know, at 6 p.m. on Election Day 2016, uh, they thought the, that they had won. And then, of course, we're all, like everybody, uh, extraordinarily right. surprised, with, but but not the Trump folks in 2016. Interesting. So the, the lesson there really is in terms of bringing in others and kind of this open outlook uh, to data. That's, I think, the point you're, you're exactly. in there. Exactly. Yeah, there are economies of scale in building larger data sets, but you don't need to own and control it all yourself. If you can work with others, uh, and we you know, talk about the different ways you can do this, um, I, I think that you can actually outperform somebody who is bigger and even better financed. Uh, a lot more there. We don't have time to get into, but I do want, before we jump to the lightning round, you end this book um, by focusing on a final consideration and and you, which you know is the most important that uh, the fundamental values of democratic freedoms and human rights really need to be uh, the, the values that we focus on in the future um, and that techno techno technological innovation needs to be guided by that. Tell us why you ended with that. Well, it's a really straightforward concept at the end of the day. Uh, you know, democracy is one of the greatest timeless values that I think all of us uh, who live in the United States and much of the world share. Um, I had the opportunity to reflect on this being in Athens and you know, look at where it was born literally 25 centuries ago. Um, I don't expect Microsoft to be here 25 centuries from now, but I hope that democracy is. Uh, and at the end of the day, I mean, the, those of us who work in the tech sector should relish the opportunity we have to be at the cutting edge of so much that's happening around the world. Um, but it's far more important that we serve democracy and that democracy not only survive but prosper. 
uh, and that we find a way to uh, help ensure that it does. I think that's what we need to do and not ever confuse ourselves into thinking that it's the other way around. Well said. Let's go to our lightning round. This is where you get to share your favorite book about Reagan, favorite Reagan speech, or favorite Reagan quote. I think you got a couple of quotes coming our way, but uh, over to you. I do. To me, the, there are two quotes that not only bookend uh, the Reagan presidency in so many ways, but I think offer timeless wisdom for us today. Uh, the first uh, was on October 28, 1980. It was the second presidential debate between Ronald Reagan and Jimmy Carter, when Carter was, in Reagan's view, mischaracterizing his views on Medicare. And Reagan responded with his favorite statement, there you go again. <laughs> we would all benefit from a civic and political discourse where someone can diffuse a situation <laughs> through an, a level of humor rather than just you know punches in the nose. It was actually far more effective, but it added a level of, I'll even say grace, uh, to American politics that has been in short supply in recent years. And then on the other uh, end of the presidency, or at least close to it, was June the 12th, 1987. And it was, of course, President Reagan's famous trip to Berlin when he said, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. And just think about that in so many ways. He wasn't speaking only for himself for the United States. He was speaking for every member of NATO and most importantly, every citizen in Germany and perhaps most especially the residents of East Berlin. And he wasn't saying we are going to, you know, you know crash into your wall with our tanks. He was using the moral authority of the presidency and Western democracy to say, this needs to come down. You need to be the one to do it. And that, too, I think, is just an extraordinary lesson for us. If we are going to you know, withstand the kinds of you know, new technology threats that we now face, we need to bring the world's democracies together, and we need to call on our moral authority as well as our technological superiority, superiority, which President Reagan talked about and invested in, as well as our collective defense. Uh, but at the end of the day, the tip of the spear is more often than not the moral case we have for human rights and democracy. And President Reagan not only recognized it, he used it to its full effect. Brad Smith, we'll end it there. Well done. Thank you so much for spending this time with us. Well, thank you, as always. Good seeing you.